Lord of Mysteries, Chapter 785, Trissy's Discovery, 1 Bachland Street, in a corner of the garden in Portland Moments Residence. The many ants and worms that were gathering there slowly dispersed as the cold, creepy sensation faded. That person with extraordinary powers likely doesn't have any experience. With her goal achieved, Hazel nodded indiscernibly before turning around briskly and strolling through the garden. She wasn't in a rush to return as she enjoyed the crimson moonlight, the cold air, and the faint flowery scent. After a long while, Hazel stopped her stroll and left the garden, entering the hall on the first story. At this moment, apart from the guests still playing Texas Hold'em, many ladies and gentlemen had bid farewell. Moments after Hazel found her mother, Ma'am Rihanna, she saw her father, Member of Parliament Mecht, and a few other gentlemen walking down as they conversed with lively expressions. Are you ready to head home? You have to visit a very important guest tomorrow morning. As Rihanna gestured for her daughter to come close, she walked towards her husband and greeted the others with a smile. Mack nodded and said, I would have loved to try another of Portland's cigars if not for that matter. Rihanna swept her gaze to Willis, Dwayne Dantes, and company, and she asked in passing, Gentlemen, what are you talking about? It sounds interesting. Mack turned his body to the side and said with a smile, Dwayne said that he encountered ghosts when he was in the southern continent. He and his companions suddenly woke up in the middle of the night and found themselves unable to open their eyes. Their bodies were heavy as though someone was pressing on them. They used a great deal of strength before escaping such a state and left their beds. However, they discovered their rooms were extremely cold. You might not know this, but East Balham's weather is hot most of the time. Then, Duane and his companions each held double-barreled hunting rifles and stood guard the entire night. They frantically left the town after the sun rose. After hearing that, Ma'am Rihanna looked at Duane Dantes with piqued interest. Is that true? Do ghosts really exist? Klein shook his head with a smile. That I'm not sure of. Perhaps my companions and I had just experienced a harrowing adventure, and our bodies and minds weren't in the best of conditions. This might have resulted in all kinds of problems. The stories he told were sourced from one of Anderson's experiences. Back when the strongest hunter of the fogs he was exploring a temple in the primitive forest, he chanced upon a specter, creating a large-scale breakout overnight. Ghosts? Hazel turned her head to look towards the garden as the corners of her mouth curved up slightly before she held back. She didn't say a word as she quietly listened to her parents bidding the rest of them farewell before returning home together. Late at night, Hazel, who had changed into a sleeping gown, walked to the balcony and stood behind a gap in the curtains. She looked towards the sewer manhole on Bachland Street. As she looked at it, her face gradually turned pale as though she had recalled an experience filled with pain and horror. She forced herself to retract her gaze, took two deep breaths, and turned around to walk to her bedside. During this process, she bit gently on her lip and muttered silently, that was likely a wraith. Definitely, I need items or charms in the sun domain. While Hazel was looking at the manhole, Klein was also doing the same. It's been days. I wonder how well that demoness, Trissy, has recovered and whether she has left or not. Thankfully, after Hazel was given a scare by me, she hasn't dared to approach the manhole. Klein's gaze swept the iron black street lamps as he nodded slightly. He opened the iron cigar case and made his wraith marionette appear within the full-body mirror. He had already decided to send Senner down the sewers to check the area to confirm Trissy's condition. He didn't want that demoness to cause any trouble. Furthermore, the sewers were just physically too close to his identity as Duane Dante's. Klein didn't wish for Trissy to be in the vicinity any longer, wishing that she could recover soon and take action. That would prompt her to leave Bachlin Street. Hum, having Admiral of Blood Center appear every once in a while would fulfill the character setting I previously created. It doesn't live nearby, and because the sewers contains a secret, it often wanders around in search of it. As Klein was thinking, he made the marionette in the ancient triangular hat leap onto the street lamp's surface before passing through the manhole cover in a wraith form, quickly approaching the hidden fork where Trissy hid herself at. Before reaching the dead end, Senner, who had night vision, could see that the area was empty. She's already recovered and left. Klein thought as he made the marionette continue forward, stopping at the spot where Trissy was previously sitting. He discovered that the place was tidied up. Not only was the ground not muddy and moist, even the moss on the walls and corner had vanished. There isn't any leftover food either. That fellow became a germaphobe after becoming a woman. No, perhaps he was like that to begin with. With Senner's vision, Klein surveyed the area and determined that either Trissy hadn't left, or she hadn't left for more than a day. Otherwise, it was impossible to maintain the cleanliness of the place. Just as this thought flashed through his mind, light footsteps sounded into the wraith's ear. 
under his control. Senna retraced his steps and wasn't surprised to see Trissy in her black dress. This demoness had her luscious black hair cascading down, unlike peers her age who had different hairstyles. It was simple and neat. Matched with her pale face that had just recovered some of its ruddiness, Trissy looked like a dreamy flower that was silently blooming in the night as expected of a demoness. Thankfully, there's a marionette in between us, otherwise, I would just end up staring at her. Heh <laughs> heh, a dead person won't be enticed. No matter how charming a demoness is, there's no way they can make the deceased climb out of a tomb like a zombie. Klein lampooned as he looked at Trissy who had a blank expression but was secretly wary, having released the invisible threads. Where did you go? Trissy pricked up her brows and said, Would you like to relieve yourself where you sleep? Uh, I thought a demoness wouldn't need to use the washroom. Klein gave a self-deprecating comment and made Senner chuckle. Are you referring to pissing and shitting? He had deliberately made the marionette say such words, as it matched Admiral of Blood's persona of a boorish pirate. Trissy indiscernibly frowned and said, Is there anything else? Senner didn't continue on the topic as he said, You look like you've almost recovered. Trissy smiled. Not bad. I'll be leaving tomorrow. She paused as she slightly narrowed her slender eyes. To be frank, I doubt whether you're the real admiral of blood at times. Of course it's real. You should ask if he's alive or dead. With his interest piqued, Klein made Senner ask, Why do you say that? Trissy's gaze swept over the wraith's face and said, It's said that Admiral of Blood is someone who indulges in his desires, and he has no resistance towards beautiful females and males. Yet, I don't see any sparks of desire when you face me. I believe the real Admiral of Blood would have added the condition of doing something I wouldn't want to in the agreement. Klein deliberated for two seconds and made Senner give a self-deprecating smile. I'm afraid of finding myself lost to pleasure and ending up being controlled by you. Trissy's expression instantly changed. This was indeed one of the reasons why she had raised the topic. To a demoness of pleasure, Beyonders who habitually indulged in their desires were natural prey. Klein actively ignored the topic and made the marionette say, You're seeking out the target tomorrow. Very clearly, the Royal Guard captain knows you and knows what you look like. After all, you were arranged by them to be by Prince Edisac's side. Klein silently added. Trissy lowered her head and looked at her toes before chuckling. Rest at ease, I have the perfect plan. As she spoke, she turned her body sideways and casually looked deep into the sewers. If you set off from here, at the end of the sixth left fork is a hidden passage. It has signs of prolonged human activity. Heh <laughs> heh. I discovered it while walking around in the past few days. I believe it has something to do with that girl, right? It's also the reason why you're here. Hidden passage. Klein didn't confirm or deny it. He made Senner smile and say, Did you discover anything? Trissy shook her head. There was nothing at all. Perhaps only a certain pathway, or someone with a specific item, can find the clues. A marauder's intuition, or something on Hazel's person. Klein didn't make Senner continue on the topic as he pressed his hand to his chest and bowed with a smile. Since you've recovered, I can be at ease. The moment he said that, he suddenly vanished. Trissy focused her eyes into a stare, but it was to no avail. Only when the invisible threads she had released was hit by a breeze did she retract her gaze, confirming that Admiral of Blood had really left. At that moment, Klein had brought the wraith back to the manhole without attempting to explore the spot which Trissy had mentioned. There were three reasons for his decision. First, it had exceeded a hundred meters. Second, he suspected that he wouldn't find anything since he wasn't from the Marauder pathway, nor did he have the corresponding items. Third, Trissy was still around. Frizz woke up naturally on a Sunday morning as she got up to wash up. As she chewed on a fresh piece of toast, she retrieved a stack of items from her mailbox. As she walked to the coffee table with a cup of coffee on it, she casually flipped through the items and discovered a reply letter she had been looking forward to. Throwing down the papers, bills, and other letters, Frizz tore open the envelope. The teacher is already in Backland. Frizz quickly read through the letter as she muttered in surprise. At the same time, she saw the toast in her mouth plunge to the ground. Chapter 786 Accounting Fraud Hat trick in on Sherwood Burroughs 22 Hope Street. Just as the attendant at the front desk was about to drink some water, she saw a lady walk in. The lady was about 1.65 meters tall, and she wore a light-colored dress with frilly sides. Her brown curly hair cascaded down as she wore colored glasses. She looked casual, just like someone who had just returned from Daisy Bay. She held a dark brown leather suitcase as she unhurriedly walked to the front desk. A lady with extraordinary disposition. Her attire is nice. How I wish I could see what she looks like without her glasses. As a female, the attendant habitually sized up her clothes and accessories. She then heard the lady say in a languid tone, One night, a single room. 
two soli and eight pence. The attendant gave her the room rate for the day and directly asked, Do you have any identification documents? She wasn't too adamant about registering her identity, because the inn had no means of confirming the authenticity of the documents. Yes, the lady put down her dark brown suitcase and took out an identification document from her handbag before passing it to her. Margaret Taylor, the attendant muttered as she registered her before finding a bunch of keys. Room 2012. Thank you. The lady in fashionable attire received the keys, carried the dark brown suitcase, and walked towards the staircase. At this moment, an attendant in a red vest came over. He bowed and asked, How may I help you? He immediately cast his gaze on the dark brown suitcase. The lady curled her lips into a smile as she shook her head. There's no need. It's very light. With that said, she didn't stop as she walked up the stairs and entered room 2012. Only after she closed the door and put down the suitcase did she raise her right hand to her chest, letting out a long sigh of relief. Why do I feel like a psychotic murderer? She was none other than the disguised force. There was nothing in her suitcase except for Mr. X's head which was wrapped in newspapers. The two attendants from before probably wouldn't have guessed that a fashionable lady didn't have any clothes, facial products, or makeup in her suitcase, but a cracked, bloody head. If they were to discover that, everyone in the inn would be given a fright. This is source material for a detective novel. Frizz calmed her feelings of anxiousness and picked up her suitcase again and opened the door. She observed the corridor and saw no one walking through it. She hurriedly walked out and headed for room 2016 and rapped on the wooden door. Her teacher, Dorian Gray Abraham, was living in the same room he previously used. After sensing someone sizing her up through the peephole, Frizz heard the doorknob twist as the gears unlocked. Dorian Gray was dressed in a black suit with very broad shoulders. He looked to the left and right warily before making way, allowing his student to enter. No one noticed you, right? Following that, he closed the door and asked cautiously. Frizz put down the suitcase and removed the colored glasses that hid half her face. No, I used a fake identity. As a Bayonder in Backland with rather rich experience as a low-sequence Bayonder, having a few fake identification documents was necessary. Furthermore, she had Zio's expert help in such matters. The only problem was that it was ultimately a fake identity that couldn't stand up to police scrutiny. However, Frizz had heard that there were places where real identity documentation could be obtained. Furthermore, they were documents which the police department had a record of, with the pictures swapped. Of course, the price was much more expensive. Dorian nodded gently and silently exhaled. As he got Frizz to sit, he brought a chair over and said, You mentioned that someone is paying to find the direct descendants of the Abraham family at a Bayonder gathering in Backland, and the goal is to find information on Mr. Dor. Yes, teacher, Frizz said nothing but the truth. I don't know much about the family, so I thought of asking you to see if you knew anything. She hid two points, namely the Bayonder gathering being called the Tarot Gathering, and that she long knew that her teacher was a member of the Abraham family. Dorian sat down and drank a sip from a white porcelain teacup. He asked with a calm expression, who was the one asking? I'm not sure. I can only confirm that it was a woman. She had concealed her appearance. Uh, she seemed very powerful and must have quite a strong backing. Frizz described her impression of Ma'am Hermit. What she didn't say was that this woman had close ties with Queen Mystic Bernadette. Dorian Gray pondered for a few seconds before saying, I don't know much either. All I know is that Mr. Dor is the ancestor of the Abraham family. He vanished during the War of the Four Emperors. You can try using this piece of information to get some of the bounty. Mr. Dor is the Abraham family's ancestor. Mr. Dor, who made the Abraham family suffer the curse of the full moon, causing many members to lose control, is actually the Abraham family's ancestor. Frizz was alarmed. Having already learned some of the problems of the Abraham family from Mr. Fool, she couldn't believe that the cause of all of this was the source of the bloodline. Does Mr. Dor not know the consequences of his actions? Frizz muttered silently as she couldn't help but frown. Dorian Gray noticed his student's abnormal reaction as he asked, somewhat puzzled, is there a problem? Oh no, I didn't manage to hide my expression. Frizz deliberated and said, I just don't understand. It's been more than a thousand years, so apart from the Abraham family's direct descendants, who would wish to gather information on Mr. Dor and why? Perhaps they're trying to find Mr. Dor. All right, Queen Mystic is Emperor Roselle's daughter, and Mr. Dor has appeared in Emperor Roselle's diary. Therefore, the Queen is trying to find Mr. Dor to figure out the truth of the past. That's normal. However, Mr. Dor vanished in the War of the Four Emperors, more than a thousand years before Emperor Roselle's era. How did they manage to contact each other? Could it be that Emperor Roselle could also hear the full moon ravings? Hum, I remember Mr. Dor making a remark that Mr. Dor might be calling for help. 
If that's the case, it's really, it's really. As an author, Frizz was momentarily at a loss for words to describe her feelings. Dorian revealed a wry smile and said, Certainly, I'm also puzzled about this problem. Remember to tell me if you find the answer. Frizz didn't harp on this matter, afraid that Dorian Gray would notice anything amiss. She then said, Teacher, why did you suddenly come to Backland? Dorian smiled and picked up a cigarette as he raised it to his nose to give it a whiff. Without lighting it, he said, I happen to have some matters that need me to be in Backland. I also decided to check on your digestion progress. In fact, he had been alarmed by Forza's letter. He couldn't believe that anyone in the world would still be asking about Mr. Dor. One had to know that even the Abraham family had given up such attempts. He was the only one who kept at it, teaching students on his own accord. This also made him recall a prophecy that was passed around within the family. The Abrahams were increasingly approaching their destruction. When he connected the two matters together, he rushed over to Backland to confirm his student's situation. He wished that she could advance as soon as possible, leaving some hope for the Abraham family. I just grasped the various astrological knowledge, Frizz replied, feeling a little guilty. Due to her lack of money, she hadn't bought the high-quality crystal ball needed by an astrologer. To not continue on this topic, Frizz began asking Dorian Gray about the acting principles needed for astrologer. Obtaining advice such as astrology isn't all-powerful. Towards the end, Frizz glanced at the dark brown suitcase beside her and said, Teacher, there's one more matter. What is it? Dorian leaned back into his chair as he leisurely drank a mouthful of black tea. Frizz followed the script she had prepared and said, After knowing that Louis Ween betrayed the organization, inflicting a great deal of harm upon all of you, I've always had the thought of finding him and exacting revenge for all of you. Give up that thought. Dorian sat up straight. Even if you have Leimano's travels, you are no match for him, much less able to kill him. I'm very glad that you have such thoughts, but there's no need to take unnecessary risks. I'm definitely not able to do it alone. Frizz mumbled silently before saying, I got to know a very powerful bounty hunter. I spent about 10,000 pounds to seek his help. She wasn't able to estimate the cost of the job, so she had used the price that Miss Audrey paid when previously entrusting them to kill the Antis ambassador. That might be a cheat. Louis Ween is likely a traveler, and he has the support of the Aurora Order. Dorian didn't hold any hopes of any bounty hunter being Louis Ween's match when he heard his students say, he has already succeeded. Cough, cough, cough. Dorian choked on his saliva as he broke out into a fit of coughs. He dropped the teacup to the ground, but it bounced up like magic, firmly landing on the coffee table. He has given me Louis Ween's head. Frizz held up the dark brown suitcase and opened it, taking out the spherical object which was wrapped in newspapers. With the newspapers unfolded bit by bit, Dorian saw that face he would never forget. The smug smile on Louis Ween's face back when he attacked the Abraham family's headquarters was gone. His head was covered in cracks, as though it had been glued together piece by piece. It was gruesome, filled with pain and despair. As an astrologer, Dorian Gray's spiritual intuition told him that it was undoubtedly Louis Ween's head. Good, very good. Dorian muttered in excitement before looking up at his student, who was the bounty hunter. I can't imagine Backland having such a powerful bounty hunter. Frizz hesitated for a moment before saying, Jamin Sparrow. Chapter 787. Dorian's Warning. Jamin Sparrow. Dorian felt the vessels on his forehead pulse when he heard that as he held his hands together, tensing up without realizing it. Situated in Pritz Harbor, he inevitably learned of the various news at sea both actively and passively, knowing far more than the residents in Backland who relied on the newspapers. In recent months, he often heard from different channels of information about Jam and Sparrow, from killing Steel Mavetti to severely injuring Vice Admiral Ailment Tracy, to successfully hunting Admiral of Blood Center. All these stories were colored with mania. He left the sea and came to Backland. He hasn't changed his trait of craziness. Dorian held back the horror and wariness that subconsciously rose in his heart as he looked at his student and said in a deep voice, It's best that you minimize your communication with that bounty hunter. He's bound to get into big trouble one day, and it wouldn't take long for that to happen. Teacher is indeed experienced and has great acumen. He instantly saw through Mr. World's intrinsic nature. Unfortunately, I'm already a member of the Tarot Club, so it's impossible not to communicate with him. Frizz adjusted her state of mind and sincerely nodded. Yes, teacher. Dorian composed himself and once again looked at his former student and current enemy, Louis Ween. However, this traveler could no longer speak. He didn't even have an iota of spirituality left. After a few seconds of silence, Dorian leaned back slightly and looked at Forz. You mentioned paying 10,000 pounds for the job. He wasn't aware of Forz's financial situation. 
other than knowing that his student was a best-selling author who likely earned quite a bit from her royalties. Furthermore, she seemed to be doing quite well in the few Beyonder circles with transactions that rewarded handsomely. Therefore, it wasn't too surprising or unacceptable that she could save up 10,000 pounds. Frizz fidgeted, feeling a slight guilty conscience as she said, Is it too expensive? She deliberately asked the question in order to hide the fact that she had mentioned a fake number, so as to show that she didn't have much experience in such matters. Dorian shook his head. No, it's too cheap. It's so cheap that I suspect whether Jamin Sparrow has other motives. As a member of the Abraham family which had suffered numerous setbacks, he often maintained a relatively high level of wariness. In the professional terminology of various clubs and gatherings, that's called a membership fee. For as lampooned as she frankly said, there were other conditions, including everything on Louis Ween's person belonging to him, as well as the requirement of me providing him help. Also, I promise that if he's in need of cash in the future, I will compensate him an additional £3,000. That's reasonable, but just barely. Dorian nodded gently and said, Usually, assassinating Louis Ween who had the Aurora Order backing him would cost at least £30,000. Hum, and if there are other situations, the price will be higher. Back then, Mr. World had used demigod powers recorded in Leimano's travels. He probably encountered something else, an Aurora Order saint. Having had an edifying experience exerted on her by the Tarot Club, Frizz wasn't unfamiliar with the Aurora Order's structure. She didn't hide her frown as she said, From the looks of it, it's indeed a little abnormal. Perhaps he's in desperate need of cash. Dorian thought and said, Perhaps he cares more about Louis Ween's Beyonder characteristic. To the Beyonders of other pathways, it can be forged into a rather useful mystical item as long as he finds a suitable artisan. Dorian paused for two seconds before adding, there's no need to worry about that. Just stay away from him in the future. Perhaps he had long targeted Louis Ween, and he was just using the information you provided to carry out the assassination while still getting an additional bonus. Dorian didn't continue on the topic as he took out a fist-sized pure crystal ball from his pocket. It's made of star crystal, and it can effectively raise your astromancy. The light shone in from outside the window as resplendent waves surfaced within the crystal ball. Without waiting for Frizz to reject, Dorian chuckled. Louis Ween is my enemy. The payment used to get rid of him should be paid by me. I don't have that much cash at the moment, and I can only use some items to deduct from the payment. No, there's no need. Frizz shook her head, partially genuine, but partially in contradiction to her will. It was genuine because she only wanted to seek revenge for her teacher back when she thought of getting rid of Louis Ween without considering the possible rewards she could later receive. It was in contradiction to her will because she couldn't reject the reward. Dorian said with a stern expression, Do you wish for me to be ashamed and uneasy? Don't worry, I still have quite a bit of wealth. Frizz nodded in response. All right then. Dorian smiled once again. Also, I've brought you the scribe potion formula. You can gather the corresponding ingredients as you digest the astrologer potion. Heh <laughs> heh. I'll prepare one of the main ingredients for you, the brain of an asman. You'll have to rely on yourself for the rest. An Asman was said to be a monster that existed in ancient times. It looked like an unprotected human brain that could fill a room. Not only could it create terrifying illusions, but it could also make its attackers die from their own attacks. As he spoke, Dorian took out a yellowish-brown goatskin and passed it to Force. Frizz received it in gratitude and quickly scanned the list of main ingredients. One complete brain of an Asman, cursed artifact of an ancient wraith. I hope I can gather the remaining ingredients before I finish digesting the astrologer potion. Just as Frizz rolled up the goatskin, she saw Dorian take out a pure golden box from his suitcase. After removing the wall of spirituality, Dorian opened the box as he said, without the gold enclosing it. The brain of an Asman will constantly affect you, causing you to hallucinate until you lose your mental facilities. Inside the squarish box was a blob of grayish-white, translucent, and wrinkled object. It was about a fifth the size of Louis Ween's head, as expected of a family with a long history. Frizz sincerely thanked him once again and received the golden box and skillfully closed it and used a wall of spirituality to seal it. Dorian didn't stop and instead gave an excuse for Frizz to stay back. He set up a ritual and summoned the void creature Malmuth who enjoyed music. He then took out two documents from the creature's spherical body. He had prepared the three items for Frizz when he received the shocking news regarding Mr. Dor. Therefore, he had it on him. These are two pieces of property in Backland. One of them is in Hilston Borough, and the other is in Sherwood Borough. They are in excellent locations and should have a total valuation of about £6,500. The amount you can sell them for will be yours, Dorian said with a smile. 
although the Abraham family was in a state of decline, as a former angel family with a long history, it still had quite a bit of resources, including land, tree farms, property, manors, and mines. However, Dorian only had control over a few, with most of the remainder belonging to the various smaller families. The place I'm renting costs 2,500 pounds in S in an OK district but an average location. What teacher gave me today does add up to about 10,000 pounds. Frizz couldn't help but sigh inwardly. In the Holy Wind Cathedral, deep blue efficient Randall Valentinus looked at the mandated Punisher deacon and said, any findings? The new Backland Archbishop was a middle-aged man with a domineering demeanor. His dark blue hair was thick and he had large earlobes. His eyes seemed to constantly hide lightning and storms within them. The mandated Punisher deacon standing before his desk was a thin middle-aged man wearing a modified captain's hat. His looks didn't stand out, but there was an anchor tattoo on his neck. The man answered reverently, Your Eminence, we've already caught some of the members who participated in the gathering. However, they have no idea who the rest are, much less know of the person who assassinated Mr. X according to their description. The assailant was about 1.6 meters tall and likely female. We can't rule out the possibility that it's a short man. Randall held back his anger and asked, What do you plan on doing next? As we are temporarily unable to know who Mr. X invited to the gathering, and 1.6 meter tall women are common, our plan is to relax our stance on the surface as we target a few suspicious targets and convert those we've caught into informants. Without us exerting any danger, those bunch of lunatics from the Aurora Order will definitely seek out the murderer themselves in order to avenge Mr. X they'll likely do a carpet search. And this way, not only will we find the assassin, but we can also discover more clues to the Aurora Order, the thin middle-aged man explained in detail. Randall nodded in thought and said, Roy, when taking action, remember to apply for a grade 1 sealed artifact. The situation is clear that the Aurora Order has at least a saint in Backlund and the assassin's strength is greater than the typical sequence 5 Bayonder, and they similarly have a demigod backing them. Yes, your eminence. Roy Wellesley struck the left side of his chest with his right fist. Dwayne, you often exceed my expectations. It hasn't taken you long to finish studying the revelation of Evernight's Book of Wisdom. Inside St. Samuel Cathedral, Bishop Electra closed the Bible in his hands and smiled at the pious tycoon with gray sideburns and deep blue eyes. Klein laughed and replied, This is expected of a believer. Next up is the study of the letters of the saints. Yes, which saint do you wish to begin with? Electra asked. Klein looked to his sides and chuckled. Let's do St. Samuel then. Electra wasn't surprised at that as he seriously introduced. St. Samuel was a backland archbishop during the fourth epoch of the Trunsost Empire. He contributed greatly to the spreading of the goddess's faith and entered her divine kingdom before dying, becoming an angel. As he spoke, he flipped to the corresponding letters of the saints. At this moment, Klein's spiritual perception was triggered. He felt a deep sense of evil and diabolical will spread above him. Following that, a cold and quiet feeling extended from underground, leveling everything and restoring the cathedral to its former tranquility. Bishop Electra snapped out of his daze and said to Duane Dantes who didn't seem to detect anything, Sorry, I just recalled something. Chapter 788, Hidden Passage It's fine, Klein replied with a warm smile. Although he didn't seem to notice anything, thoughts were flying through his mind. He began considering what the anomaly that happened during that instant meant. Previously, the keepers would head upstairs along the nearby staircase. It can be preliminary determined that they live there, coinciding with the area where the anomaly happened. The keepers aren't in the best of conditions, so the chances of them losing control are greater than ordinary Bayonders, causing them to suddenly release a sense of an evil and diabolical will. And this was suppressed and quelled by the core seal deep behind Chani's gate. If that's the case, there are two possibilities. One, the core seal behind Chani's gate can sense all the anomalies in St. Samuel Cathedral, and then react instinctively. Second, during the Keeper's watch over the years, they are constantly corroded by the core seal's powers. In a certain sense, they are a part of it, or they bear the weight of the corresponding traits. Once any abnormalities happen, their bodies will immediately intervene. If it's the former, that means that when I knock a keeper unconscious and replace him, it will easily be detected by the core seal behind Chani's gate. It will produce an anomaly like before, causing my plan to fail right at the beginning. If it's the latter, I'll definitely be repelled when entering Chani's gate, even when disguised as a keeper. I need to figure out the problem before coming up with a direct countermeasure. It's really difficult to steal sealed artifacts from the various churches. It's no wonder almost no one is willing to do so. 
as Klein's thoughts wandered, he superficially paid attention to Bishop Electra's explanation of St. Samuel's experiences and letters that he left behind. When it was almost time, he politely bade him farewell. After returning to 160 Bockland Street, he saw his butler approach just as he handed his hat and cane to Richardson. Sir, do you plan on holding a ball or banquet next weekend and invite the neighbors? Walter wasn't using a suggestive tone, but a tone of inquiry. However, Klein knew very well that since his butler had raised the matter, it meant that it was almost time. He nodded gently and said, Sorry night then. A ball. I'll have to trouble you and Tanja to make the preparations. Is there enough money? When saying the last statement, Klein looked to his housekeeper. Tanja sternly nodded and said, There's enough. The various alcoholic beverages in your wine cellar is enough to handle several banquets. When moving into 160 Bockland Street, Klein had handed her 1,000 pounds in cash for the household expenses. From the looks of it, even with the need to replenish fine wine, tea leaves, and coffee beans, it wasn't something that could be spent in a month. The gold pound is rather strong after all. Klein nodded and smiled. Let's not use wine that's too expensive for our first ball. It's common to be reserved in loan. Yes, sir. Although Walter was very aware of how to run a ball, he still paid serious attention to his employer's instructions. He paused and said, There are only two things you need to do. First, it's to settle the guest list with our help, thinking up some small talk for each guest, matching the person's corresponding status and experience. Second, it's to order a suit for the ball. How troublesome. When greeting Hazel, can I say that the sewers here are cleaner than the squares in the southern continent? As Klein sighed and lampooned, he nodded slightly. No problem. Deep into the night, the crimson moon hung high in the sky. The smog which had significantly thinned made Backland have an additional sense of tranquility. In Duane Dante's master bedroom, Klein set up a ritual to summon himself. He planned on entering the sewers tonight to confirm that Trissy had left. He then planned on heading for the fork she had described, to explore the so-called hidden passageway to see if he could discover anything. Klein didn't have extravagant hopes of gaining anything. He was only worried that the secret hidden in the sewers would pose a hidden risk that would one day explode. This could easily involve Duane Dantes who lived nearby, spoiling his plans and stealing the Antigonus family's notebook. On this matter, I can't be an ostrich that buries its head in the sand and pretend not to know anything. I should discover the problem early and destroy what needs destroying or report what needs reporting before it completely erupts. That's the most effective solution. Of course, I also need to be sufficiently careful. I mustn't let my exploration end up lighting a fuse. Klein's spirit body tore out of the candlelight, and with Azik's copper whistle augmenting him, he possessed the physical body of Duane Dantes, controlling him to walk to the boundary of the wall of spirituality and sit in the reclining chair. To the external world, it looked as though the tycoon had dozed off reading the papers. Summoning my soul to possess my own body feels different from returning to my body. There's an obvious barrier in between. Klein did a comparison of the experience and floated to his desk, cleaning up most of the items on the altar and leaving behind the candle that maintained his summoning to burn silently. After doing all of this, Klein wore creeping hunger, and with Azik's copper whistle, death knell, and the center gold coin in possession, he flew out of the master bedroom and left 160 Bockland Street, drilling into the sewers. Just as Klein found himself in the moist and dirty environment, he immediately released Wraith Center and made his marionette open up a distance from him, turning into the hidden fork where Trissy was previously recuperating. This time, he saw that the clean region in the sewers was already stained with dirt containing signs of rats. From the looks of it, Trissy has really left. Klein, who was following far behind, heaved a sigh of relief. As a spirit body, he didn't need to breathe, nor did he need to walk on the ground. Therefore, he didn't mind how disgusting the sewers were. Senner walked out of the area and continued walking ahead and turned on the sixth left turn. Klein constantly maintained a distance of 50 meters, perfectly acting the role of the person behind the scenes. At the end of the fork was a corroded wall covered in moss. At a glance, there weren't any abnormalities to it. If Trissy hadn't mentioned it, Klein wouldn't have gotten his marionette to observe every inch of the area in detail. A few minutes later, Senner suddenly straightened his back and walked forward, entering the wall. Passing through the rather thick obstacle, Klein's eyes opened up. With the marionette's vision, he saw a half-natural, half-artificial cave. It wasn't more than 1.8 meters high and was about 3 meters wide. The ground was littered with tools like shovels which were wrapped in oilskin and large piles of mud and rubble. Right up ahead were two hidden passageways that extended downwards. The left one was about 5 to 6 meters deep, while the one on the right was nearly 10 meters deep. 
However, nothing seemed to have existed in them, as though they were still being excavated. This was dug up by Hazel. In the day, she's an arrogant lady of high society, and at night, she's an excavator in the sewers. Furthermore, she's moving the dirt and rubble one pail at a time. She was loitering around to find the exact spot, and digging was the subsequent step. That wall must have been a secret door. Klein hid himself at the fork's entrance as he made center scrutinize the area. Following that, he made the wraith enter the left passage until he reached a completely sealed off area. Center's figure slowly turned faint as it turned incorporeal. In this state, he passed through the soil and explored deeper. But even when reaching the hundred meter limit, he didn't discover anything of use. All he saw were ordinary insects and worms. Klein made the marionette switch directions, swimming in the sea of soil without finding anything. Senner soon returned to the cave from before and entered the right passageway without being affected by any obstacles. There's still nothing. It's not without reason that Trissy determined that it will only work for a particular pathway or being in possession of a certain item. Come, she must have probed the area with the invisible threads of a demoness of pleasure. Unfortunately, I've already lost Tinder. I wonder if the Grey Fog's aura on me would work. It seems to strongly attract Beyonders from the Marauder pathway. Klein silently commented and, using his spirit body state, planned on personally visiting the two hidden passageways that Hazel had dug up. However, he curbed his desire because he was now a marionist. Doing it personally in situations that didn't require it was in violation of the acting principles. It's fine even if I don't use the Grey Fog's aura. I'll just request to purchase a mystical item from the Marauder Pathway during tomorrow afternoon's tarot gathering. It doesn't need to be too expensive. It can just correspond to sequence 8 or 9. Hum, that badge from Lanevis is only a signal receiver, not an item of this pathway. While not aware of the exact situation of what's hiding inside, rashly using my spirit body to explore it might result in me attracting a high-sequence monster. Being careful and cautious will forever be a condition for myself. Klein slowly heaved a sigh of relief and retrieved Wraith Center. He wasn't worried that Hazel would continue coming in the near future. Any person with normal intelligence wouldn't continue coming unless they had the means to deal with the situation from before. Ignoring how Hazel hasn't had any contact with Beyonder Circles, even if she has, getting an item from the Sun Domain isn't simple. After all, Backland is the territory of the Church of Storms. I do have something that I don't use often. Haha. <laughs> Can I find an opportunity to sell it to her and then let her use it to harm my marionette? Klein jeered at himself before shaking his head with a laugh. He ended the summoning and returned above the gray fog, vanishing from the sewers. On Monday morning, the bright sunlight tore through the thin clouds, shining onto every corner of Backland. Imlin White pulled down on his silk top hat. As he left the carriage and walked to the harvest church, he squinted his eyes and mumbled, What terrible weather. Backland's worst season is coming soon. He was just about to step onto the stairs when he saw a paperboy approach him, handing him a copy of the Tussock Times. Sir, today's morning papers. Imlin wanted to reject it when he discovered a small slip clasped in the middle of the boy's fingers. Yeah. Imlin maintained his countenance as he took out a penny and passed it to the boy, receiving the copy of the Tussock Times and the slip. Before entering the Harvest Church, he quickly spread it open and scanned it. There are clues to the people you are looking for. Please come to the Bravehearts Bar. Chapter 789, Each Person's Monday. 9.30 a.m., Backland Bridge Area, Iron Gate Street, Bravehearts Bar. And Lynn White stood rooted to his spot after he got down from the carriage. He stared ahead in a daze, nearly forgetting to avoid the sunlight. At that moment, the bar's main door was shut with no signs of it opening. As a sanguine who seldom left his home and only went to places like bars at night, Imlin never expected the bar to be closed in the morning. He had left the Harvest Church in a rush via the transportation system after seeing the paper slip, hoping to obtain any first-hand intelligence. To save time, he even tolerated the cramped environment and stench of the metro. At that moment, Imlin was somewhat peeved, but he knew that he had made the mistake. All he could do was pull a face and circle around Iron Gate Street to not waste his trip. Just as he was about to approach a rental carriage that stood along the street, he caught sight of a familiar figure from the corner of his eye. The person was wearing a brown rounded top hat and an old coat while carrying a ragged haversack. He was none other than Ian, the underground arms dealer and intelligence merchant. Hee hee, I have quite good intuition. I knew he would appear early. And Lynn was delighted as he stuffed his hands into his pockets and leisurely walked over, blocking Ian's way as he chuckled. Good morning. Ian looked up and glanced at the handsome man before him, replying in puzzlement, Good morning, Mr. White. You should have come in the evening. It seems to be a suitable time now, Emlyn said with a smile, clearly in a good mood. Ian, why do you always wear the same clothes and outfit every time I see you? 
Ian answered without minding the question. This can make me appear more mature while allowing me to keep a low profile. Of course, the main reason is that I lack money. The final sentence was added with a joking tone. I look forward to your attire in summer, Imlin said with a scoff. I'll take off my coat. As Ian spoke, he took out two pieces of paper from his ragged haversack. They were the bounty notices that Imlin had previously given him. Someone in Eastboro saw this person. He handed over one of the papers to Imlin, and on it was the name, Argos. Realizing that there really were clues to the primordial moon believers, Imlin asked in delight, where is he? Ian didn't reply as he looked at him with a silent smile. Experienced, Imlin immediately took out his wallet and gave 150 pounds to Ian. That's your reward. Ian smiled and said, there's still another half to go. Another half. Imlin nearly wanted to let this merchant in front of him know the prowess of a sanguine. This was because an effective clue cost 20 pounds, while an exact location cost 150 pounds. However, he quickly read between the lines as he asked in pleasant surprise. Another one was found. Yes, Ian handed him the remaining piece of paper in his hand. While my friend observed Argos and confirmed his residence, it was discovered that he had met with this person named Gollies Kevin. Therefore, I've obtained the residence of the two targets at the same time. Very good. Then Lin emptied his wallet and gave another 150 pounds to Ian. He was abnormally delighted. He felt that the ancestor and Mr. Fool were blessing him. This was because there were only five targets, and he had successfully hunted one. Now, with two additional clues, all he needed to do was succeed in order to declare himself victor regardless of what the other sanguine did. Ian seriously counted and checked the notes before saying with a suppressed voice, Argos is on the third story of the apartment block at East Borough's 6 Limestone Street, opposite the public washroom. Golly's Kevin is similarly in East Borough. He stays in the room beside the staircase on the first floor at 19 Beluga Whale Street. I will confirm your intelligence. I believe you wouldn't wish to abandon your business for a mere 300 pounds. Imlin nodded gently as he gave a warning. Following that, he chuckled and said, they were found so easily. Ian's red eyes darted around slightly as he said, first, many bounty hunters are my friends. They have many informants in East Borough. Second, those two gentlemen didn't have great disguises. Despite being in East Borough, they wore very different attire from the people around them. If they were willing to wear more ragged clothes and did more than 12 hours of labor work, I believe they would be hard to find in the messy East Borough. Is that so? One needs to take note of the difference in environment when hiding oneself. Imlin muttered silently to himself, feeling as though he had learned a new trick. He didn't plan on heading to East Borough immediately. This was because even if he took action in the day, it would be very difficult to escape without causing a commotion. It was a rather dangerous act in Backland, as it meant that the mandated punishers or Nighthawks might come knocking at the door just after he sneaked back home. Emlyn planned on verifying the situation and taking action between 8 to 9 in the evening after the tarot gathering. The primordial moon believer from before was quite strong. These two likely aren't weaker. Although I have confidence, it feels unsafe only relying on myself. As Emlyn considered the problem, he waved his hand and bade Ian farewell. He rode on a rental carriage, heading back for the south side of the bridge. East Chester County, Stone City. Audrey stood behind a railing, watching the servants placing the items that had been brought from the family castle in suitable spots. The scene was bustling but orderly. I'll send someone to associate Professor Michelle later and tell him that I'll be paying a visit to the Relic Search and Preservation Foundation. I hope that they've obtained some items that have been tainted with Beyonder effects. As Audrey's mind wandered, she couldn't help but smile. She was proud of her decision of donating the funds to establish the foundation. When her eyes that were as beautiful as emeralds saw the time on the wall clock, she hurriedly reined in her thoughts and turned to return to her bedroom. Susie was slumped in a corner of the bedroom. Its front paws were crossed, giving it a sense of elegance. In front of it was an open book. There were dense lines of text written on it. Susie would raise one of her front paws from time to time to flip the page as she read with great seriousness. Every time I see Susie like that, I feel a little ashamed. Audrey, you mustn't slack off on your education. Audrey encouraged herself in silence as she approached, planning to get Susie to head outside to guard the door. Susie looked up and glanced at Audrey before standing straight up, saying, I got it. After saying that, it briskly ran out the bedroom without closing the door. I haven't said anything. Audrey blinked as she softly muttered to herself. She had given such instructions many times. To prevent Susie from detecting that she wanted to be alone in the room from 3 to 3.30 p.m. on Mondays, forbidding humans and dogs from coming close. She had also done similar matters at other times, pretending that there was a gathering, wanting alone time while maintaining an irregular pattern. 
I have to say that Susie's existence has effectively raised my motivation to learn, as well as how strictly I handle matters. I can't be inferior to a dog. But, being better than this dog doesn't seem to be something worthy of praise. Audrey puffed her cheeks with a self-deprecating comment as she sat by her bed, awaiting the beginning of the tarot gathering. 3 p.m. above the gray fog, dark red figures shot up along the two sides of the long bronze table, materializing into different blurry figures. Good afternoon, Mr. Fool Audrey's greeted with a cheery voice as she bowed. The other members greeted one after another until the existence at the seat of honor nodded in response. While sitting down, Frizz couldn't help but look at Mr. World, wondering what she should use as an opening. Apart from passing on her teacher's reply to Ma'am Hermit, she planned on doing a few matters. One, she wanted to tell Mr. World that due to the difficulty of the mission, she would pay him more, but it required him to wait. This was because the sale of the houses took time. Second, after brainstorming, she thought of a good way that could earn money and raise her strength. She had gained inspiration from the world's actions, rent out Leimano's travels. When a member needed an item to temporarily raise their combat strength to deal with certain situations, they could rent Leimano's travels from her. The rent could be paid in two forms, cash which wasn't too expensive or to record Bayonder powers instead. This also meant that the renter had to guarantee that the spellbook was returned with more filled pages. Of course, as the provider, Frizz would record useful apprentice powers like door opening, providing the renter with relevant help. A problem that could easily happen in this transaction was that the renter might not return it. But with Mr. Fool witnessing these exchanges in the tarot club, Frizz believed that no one would be blinded by greed and the death of the renter was a low-probability event for losing Leimano's travels. But with everyone knowing that they could pray to Mr. Fool in times of danger, death was an even smaller probability. How can there not be any risks when doing business? I will talk to Mr. World about when he will use it so that there won't be any conflicts. Fuzz retracted her gaze and heard Ma'am Hermit speak. Honorable Mr. Fool, I have two pages of Roselle's diary this time. Ever since contact was made with Queen Mystic, the receiving of diary pages has stabilized in a rather terrifying manner. Klein nodded slightly and chuckled. Very good. After a brief silence, Catalia conjured two yellowish-brown pieces of paper. They leaped into Mr. Fool's palms as if they had tunneled through the spirit world. Klein slowly lowered his gaze at the diary in his hands. The 29th of December. It's almost a new year again. All the mausoleums have been built. What's done cannot be undone. 